Uh, kia ora tato, everybody. Um, Bruce Arrells, I am. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit. Just like to welcome you to this webinar tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ryan Paul, who's an Auckland graduate and a endocrinologist and diabetologist at the Waikato District Health Board. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Waikato and has been doing an enormous amount of training on the new diabetes drugs this year, uh, dulaglutide or Trulicity, which is what we're dealing with tonight, and the other one, Jardians or Empagliflozin. So he's going to be talking about dulaglutide tonight, and I hand over to Ryan. Welcome, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Kura koutou, um, everyone, and thank you for, I guess, your interest in diabetes and these trying times. I hope you're all um, working through it okay. Um, and this is really try to be a very pragmatic talk on how to use um, dulaglutide. As I know many of you have seen um, similar webinars before, and I have modified um, this one to really try and um, make it a bit more hands-on, so different cases, um, different examples of, of to work, uh, how we can work through it. So I really thought um, one thing I'm very passionate about, and it's talking about clinical inertia in type 2 diabetes. Also in, um, you know, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and worldwide, it's our biggest barrier to achieving optimal care. And if we take an example um, in Auckland, um, that you know, there's been this sort of disbelief that um, many of our patients with suboptimal glycemic control are out, in out of touch with the health system. But we know that at least 99% of patients with type 2 diabetes are actually enrolled in a practice. And over 90% of these patients are attending um, the practice at least two times a year. And that's not even counting um, contact with secondary care. And if we take those at a highest risk, for example, those on HbA1c over 75 millimole per mole, we know, you know at least two thirds actually had the same HbA1c a year ago. And at least three quarters of these patients are still receiving the regular scripts um, for their glucose lowering therapies. So they're in touch. And it's really about how can we make you know, the most of the opportunities that we have um, with our patients, and that applies to both primary care and secondary care, and really optimizing their, um, their diabetes care. And um, because it is important um, when we think, sorry, um, that, so I haven't I've skipped a screen, um, but inequities um, are really, really prevalent in type 2 diabetes. So we know in Aotearoa, New Zealand, it's over 280,000 now that have type 2 diabetes. And most of those patients will die from cardiovascular disease. And I think it's really important to keep in your back in the back of your mind, what is actually going to cause the morbidity and mortality um, in my patients? And it creates some of our greatest disparities um, for Māori and Pacific. So not only are they more likely to get type 2 diabetes, um, also much more likely to die from cardiovascular disease. And, you know, at least fourfold more likely to end up on dialysis um, from diabetic renal disease. And the figures are a lot worse for Pacific um, than they are for Māori. And what's also come out with the new um, PREDICT equation for our cardiovascular risk, um, which almost all of you will be using um, within your practice, is that we know that, um, that the risk factors in terms of Māori and Pacific dying from heart disease are all due to modifiable, modifiable risk factors. And it's not due to ethnicity. So it shows that you know, we can actually do something. It's very hard to fix socioeconomic deprivation, which is a major factor as part of that. But we can all look at our own prescribing and see what we can do um, with regards to um, making changes there. I've done that screen. And really, 2021 has been the year of change um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. You know, with, until, you know, it was really only until um, earlier this year that the only glucose-lowering therapies that we had available, which are funded, which reduced cardiovascular disease up and above the effects on glycemic control were metformin and pioglitazone. Now we've got two more, the big key players. Um, as Bruce said, we've got empagliflozin or Jardiance or Jardiamet in combination with metformin that came out in February. And there's dudaglutide or Trulicity um, that came available in September. And I hope most of you had experience with, with using these agents. Um, but if you're not aware, they're funded under special authority criteria and they're very appropriate criteria. And they've also got an ethnicity clause um, for anyone that has Maori or Pacific ethnicity, um, basically to improve access. It makes it a lot easier. Um, you know, if you've got a patient, you know, who's coming in the door, they're going to qualify for these agents if the HBNC is above target. And I'll go, I'll go through, the, through the criteria. 
And I guess two main points I want to want to hammer home is that these benefits of both dutaglutide and empagliflozin, uh, not only up and above the effects on glycemic control, but up and above what we have with our, you know, our traditional management of metformin, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers and statins. Now they don't replace those agents. Okay, and it's really important to think. You know, I still want to have all my patients with, you know, with cardiovascular disease to be on metformin, you know, to be on aspirin, to be on statins. Um, but these are new agents which now have a major role in preventing events. And the great advantage of them is that they typically lead to um, weight loss. And whereas most of the other time our patients are gaining weight and they do not cause hypoglycemia alone. Okay, they're only going to cause hypoglycemia if a patient's on insulin or sulfonylureas as well. So unlike um, or unlike insulin and, and, and sulfonylureas, you know, patients are losing weight, you don't need to worry about hypoglycemia, which obviously is a big impact on jobs um, and just every, everyday life. So I thought I would, would kick off, um, and this is, um, sorry, uh, Mrs. R, this is a patient that she saw uh, approximately two weeks ago that came into a research trial. Um, so it's, this is a, re a real life um, example recently. Um, she's a 53-year-old Maori woman um, with long-standing type 2 diabetes in this sort of typical background that we see, you know, with hypertension, dyslipidemia, and, and quite marked um, central obesity. Now, her HbA1c was 97 millimole per mole, and that was despite ensuring adherence um, with low-dose metformin and 50 units of, of Lantus. And the major question was, she obviously needed escalation of, of therapy. Um, she, um, you know, she was obese, so here we've got these new agents coming in, and should she be on duoglutide or empagliflozin? And so we actually opted um, to start um, dutaglutide um, at the 1.5 milligram dose each week. And we also increased the metformin up to, to maximize, um, maximize that dose. And this is the trace of your continuous glucose monitoring literally within, um, within, within two weeks. Um, so if you're not aware here, we've got the glucose levels between 3.9 um, and 10 millimole per liter. And you can see that here, um, glucose levels are basically stay within range. This is compatible with an HbA1c of about 50 millimole per mole. So we got it to target within a few weeks. And it shows really, I guess, the, the potency of, of dutaglutide, um, particularly in combination with, with other therapy. So I really want to, to take it home. This, these drugs do work. You know, they make a major difference. And we'll go through the ins and outs to see how we can make the most of that um, for, for your patients. So what is um, dutaglutide? I know some of you may have not ever heard of it before, and or how does it work? So glucagon um, like um, peptide one or GLP one um, is uh, a cretin, um, um, is the main major, basically major gut hormone that's produced in response to food going through the gut, and that acts directly on um, our beta cells um, or beta cells and alpha cells in the pancreas. So what that does increases um, glucose-dependent insulin production by the pancreas. So what that means is basically, you know, if glucose levels are higher, you get greater insulin production. If your glucose levels are normal or low, you won't get any increased um, um, production of insulin. So that is why these agents have never caused severe hypoglycemia in any trials or use, um, because basically if, if your glucose levels are, you know, are normal, um, there won't be any extra production. It's only when, when they're high. So all of a sudden you can see it's great um, around meals um, in terms of reducing that, that postprandial rise. They also work by decreasing glucagon production. So one of the major, I guess, mechanisms of, oh, mechanisms of hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes is there is increased glucagon levels. It leads to increased hepatic gluconeogenesis and the liver pumping out, um, pumping out glucose. So you've got um, two really you know, major mechanisms of, of, how, of how it works. And I'll, I'll go through the other ones, which are really important in a second. But um, basically agents which mimic um, the action of GLP-1 or the GLP-1 receptor agonists have been around worldwide for a long time. You know, we've had experience in them for 15, 16 years. And dutaglutide itself has been available since 2014. It's great that we've finally got them here funded um, as they are you know, major tools um, in the armory. Been great to have them sooner, but we're definitely not complaining that they're here now. So this is the incretin effect. And this is just really just going through how these, how these agents work. I'll, I'll go through this. So 
what it is, is if you were given a dose of glucose and you're given the same dose, um, you either you know you ate it, or you gave the dose versus IV, you get a much greater production of insulin if you have, have it orally. And that is due to basically the glucose in the gut stimulating the production of GLP-1, which then um, goes to the pancreas and you get the increased insulin production. And that's what's known as the incretin effect. Now, in type 2 diabetes, um, what we, um, we know is that patients have lower levels of GLP-1 and they also have reduced action of, of GLP-1. So all of a sudden, we're addressing another major mechanism of what causes type 2 diabetes. So we're actually addressing the underlying pathophysiology and not just, for example, trying to increase insulin production when we know that may already be high. So it's not just the pancreas um, where deuteroglutide acts, um, and it has some really exciting other actions. So in particular, um, it, it works on the stomach to delay, or, or the gut, um, to delay the transit of food. Um, and this is part of the reason um, why patients actually feel more full. It reduces their appetite. It also acts directly on appetite centers. Um, and what, as a result, you often see patients um, losing weight, which is actually fantastic. It's what the vast majority of our patients with, with diabetes need. Um, it also acts on the heart and blood vessels. And um, you can see the mechanisms there um, by which we actually get reduced cardiovascular disease. So all of a sudden, we know we're treating that morbidity and um, mortality around, around um, diabetic complications. It also works directly on the kidney, and I'll go through this in a little bit more detail, um, which likely sl um, slows the progression of, of renal disease. I will say it's not as hard, as hard and fast as empagliflozin or jardiance, um, but it's definitely um, likely a role for deuteroglutide um, in renal disease as well, which, which, I'll, which I'll talk about. It also has some other actions, um, but this is just a pictorial, just ex explaining all the actions. Um, but all of a sudden you can see, you know, it's not just um, the pancreas we're looking at, it's addressing other mechanisms, working the brain, the liver, um, the gut, and in terms of reducing cardiovascular and, and renal disease. So it's treating a, a whole patient um, with, with diabetes. So one important point um, to remember is if you're going to start a patient on deuteroglutide, that you stop their vildagliptin. Um, and that may be either as galvis itself, or it may be in combination with, as, as galvamet. So with that, um, the reason for that is what vildagliptin is, is vildagliptin inhibits the enzyme dipeptidase 4 or DPP4. That's the enzyme in, in the body which um, inhibits the breakdown of GLP-1. Now, deuteroglutide is it, or can't be broken down um, by vildagliptin. So vildagliptin becomes redundant, um, and so you get no benefit at all from it, but you still get the potential of adverse effects. And so that's why it's really important, you know, if you're starting a, uh, a patient on um, deuteroglutide that you stop the vildagliptin, to be honest, it's not a disaster if it happens. You know, sometimes you might forget or miss it, but make sure that the first opportunity that you can and um, that you do stop the, the vildagliptin. So what is trulicity or deuteroglutide? So one of, um, I guess, main point to know is it only comes um, in injection form as a, as a subcutaneous injection. And we've only got the one dose. So internationally, um, there's also the 0.75 milligram, three milligram and um, 4.5 milligram doses. Hopefully they come at some stage over the next few years. Um, but it does make things actually easier um, that we start off just with the one dose. So there's no need for, no need for dose titration. The packs um, of, um, injections um, that once weekly injections and they're often dispensed um, in packs of four. A pen can be stored um, outside at room temperature for up to two weeks, but otherwise it's kept in the fridge. So I know that some of you may have found that there's initially delay um, in um, deuteroglutide in, in pharmacies, and part of that was around storage and distribution. But just advising your patients to make sure they put the pens in the fridge when they pick up their script. Um, the other one is that they can, you know, it's a once a week injection. They can be injected any time of the day, any day of the week. Um, and it's the usual injection sites that you would, you know, for, for a normal subcut injection. Um, patients are often used to insulin. Um, they're very used to, um, I guess, doing the injection in, in these sites. And you can also let your patients know that if they miss a dose, they can take it up to three days late. So what that means is you're not going to take a dose of deuteroglutide within three days of each other. 
Um, so if you've got a patient, for example, that normally takes it on a Sunday and they don't realize the Thursday that they missed the dose, we're going to wait again until the next, next Sunday, for example. But if, um, say it was Tuesday, we'd well, absolutely, absolutely fine to go ahead with the dose. So you can take it up to, up to 72 hours late um, and no, no later after that. And here's what the pens look like. Um, I don't know if many of you have seen the demonstration pens. They can actually be a little bit bigger than what the pens are in real life, but they're very straightforward to, to use. So one important thing to note is that patients won't see the needle. It's got an inbuilt 29 gauge needle um, and all um, patients do, I hope you can see my arrows. You literally uncap the pen, um, you place it, um, so for example, against the abdomen, then you get the patient to switch, basically unlock the pen, and that involves just twisting the top from the, the red padlock um, to the green um, green open, then you push and hold um, for, for 10 seconds. Um, and then um, basically you can see um, then if the injection is, is complete, and you're also encouraging your patients to dispose of the, of the pen um, as you normally would for injections in, in your DHB um, region. The risk of um, basically needle stick injury is negligent or negligible since you know, the needle is completely retracted, um, but still advised to go through the, the normal disposal processes. Um, so you know, for pa patients on insulin, that's very easy, um, but for patients that, that aren't on um, in terms of on any injections or needles already, then it's about also setting up a disposal um, process for them as well. So the big question is, what are the improvements that you see? And like um, Jardians, I will say that the um, improvement in HbA1c is all dependent um, really on the baseline HbA1c and how much, I guess, you get changed with diet as well. It's a really important time to reinforce you know, lifestyle management. Can you get dietary change? Because here's a time where patients will have a reduced appetite. You can strike while the iron's hot in terms of making major changes to their, um, their dietary patterns. So if a patient's got a good baseline HbA1c, for example, 56 millimole per mole, the improvement's only roughly about six millimole um, per mole. Now remember our target um, is less than 53 um, in the majority of patients. So you're still getting patients to target. Um, for example, you know, you will get a bigger um, HbA1c reduction, even on average 13 millimole per mole for HbA1c in the 60s. And you can see, you know, to up to um, 25 millimole per mole in patients with an HbA1c greater than 70. I've seen far greater in terms of experience so far, you know, even um, compatible with, with, you know, 40 millimole per mole reductions in patients um, which have, you know, made major changes. So these really are game changes compared to um, what agents we had previously. Um, Duoglutide is probably the agent which leads to the biggest reduction in glycemic control apart from um, that we have available apart from insulin. Okay, so this is the, you know, the next best um, agent in getting a dramatic reduction. And in fact, what's really interesting, if, if you look at the reductions versus insulin itself, so there have been trials that have taken patients insulin naive um, with an HbA1c above target, and they've given them either dudoglutide or um, basal insulin, and they found that um, the reduction in HbA1c was double in the dudoglutide group than it was in the insulin group. Now, there are like multiple reasons for that. One big advantage is you can start the dudoglutide, you don't need to change the dose um, at present in New Zealand, and there's no risk of hypoglycemia unless the patient's on sulfonylurea as insulin. Whereas you need to, I mean, you'll likely be starting a lot slower and building up with insulin. There's also the reduction in um, oral intake in terms of with dudoglutide with insulin, you may actually get slightly increased appetite. And there's other potential mechanisms um, as well. So, you know, these are can be a very good alternative to insulin in, in the right situations. And what's also exciting is that if you've got a patient that's got an HbA1c to target, and they may be on, um, you know, it doesn't matter if they're on basal or prandial insulin, if they're on, you know, roughly less than 40 units a day, there's a very good chance you'd be able to get them off insulin, which is really what, you know, what we want to do if possible. If a patient's got end-stage type 2 diabetes, I'll be honest, you're very unlikely to get them off. But you know, most of our patients aren't in that camp yet. There's a chance we can get them off insulin, um, particularly if they're able to lose some weight. Um, so it really is um, you know, a great new tool in the armory. The weight loss that you get with dudoglutide is only modest in terms of on average at, at two kilograms over, the, over five years. 
But you have to remember that um, in patients, either on, on placebo or what we see in real life, they're typically gaining weight. So the difference in um, weight's far greater. And I've seen um, patients, you know, and this is sort of more with, with other GLP-1 um, agonists as well, since deuteroglutide's only been available since September, but the weight loss can be far, far greater if you combine it with, with lifestyle management. You also get independent reductions in um, blood pressure and LDL cholesterol, they're only mild, but it helps when we're thinking about the reductions in cardiovascular disease. So I know we all um, like um, numbers need to treat in terms of giving it a rough ballpark. So um, if we look at um, MACE events or those you know, major adverse cardiovascular events, the cardiovascular death, um, non-fatal EMI or non-fatal stroke, um, deuteroglutide's got an NNT of 18. Um, for over five years for secondary prevention. So those that already have established cardiovascular disease. Now that NNT, uh, I think is pretty good. And it's in addition to all the other, you know, to aspirin, statins um, and, and other agents. Okay, so it's on top of that um, again. And what is also exciting for deuteroglutide is that for those that um, do not have um, existing cardiovascular disease, but a high risk. So now we're talking about primary prevention, the NNTs are 60. So really this is the only other um, agent apart from metformin um, that's been shown to have a potential role in primary prevention of cardiovascular events. At this stage, empagliflozin uh, has not been shown to um, have a role in primary prevention. So this may be one thing which I'll come to, which, you know, what do I choose? I choose empagliflozin or do I choose um, deuteroglutide? Primary prevention may twist your arm towards um, using um, deuteroglutide. It's also been shown to basically reduce the development of macroalbuminuria and those of mild renal disease. But I will stress, we're still waiting the studies to show that it prevents the need for dialysis or renal death. Now, this is different from empagliflozin, where we know that it definitely reduces the need for dialysis or renal death. So if you had a patient with renal disease, that's one thing that's going to you know, push your arm probably more towards empagliflozin than, than deuteroglutide. But, you know, deuteroglutide is the next cab off the rank. It may be a very suitable alternative if empagliflozin isn't suitable. And we all know our patients just don't walk in the door with one problem either. So it's putting all the, all the pieces of the puzzle together and trying to work out what's best, best for your patients. And remember, these are additional to the reductions in, the, in, in glycemic control. So, you know, they, they are um, great agents. But they're not all perfect. We all, they all have adverse effects. And I think it's really important to warn your patients and give them a heads up, really, what, what's, you know, what can they expect? Because I'll take the ones that know what's going to happen, do far, far better um, than the ones that just, you know, um, have no education and just land on it. So the most common um, adverse effect by far is, is nausea. And, you know, it's, it's really varied in trials from 8 to 30%. Typically, it's only mild nausea and um, sort, of, sort of peaks about two to three days after the first injection and then gradually weans off over the next two to three weeks despite continuing um, with, with injections. Now, very rarely can it be associated with um, vomiting or, or diarrhea. I I've, I've, haven't personally had um, any problems with, with either, but I have heard of the odd case, but it's still less than the 2%. Even the latest data suggests it's about 1.5% of patients that you need to end to stop deuteroglutide because of um, actually because of severity of their GI symptoms. But you know, for 98.5%, they can keep going and they're absolutely fine. But just reassuring patients that it may happen and it's transient and it will go away is, re is really important thing to, thing to do. The other really common, well, I say really common, you know, we're still talking about less than 10% of patients, but they may develop a transient injection site reaction, and that's usually just a little bit of redness or perhaps mild itching of the day or two um, after, after the injection. Very rarely do you have to use antihistamines, but you've got that potential there um, that you could do um, if you had to. But once again, they typically dissipate despite continuing with treatment. Now, if you read um, the, in terms of the full adverse risk um, profile, um, you will see um, on their pancreatitis um, and medullary thyroid carcinoma. And that's both slightly um, controversial. I'll go through them. In the initial trials, um, there were cases of pancreatitis um, in those on GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, but when you actually look at the trial, there's no difference versus placebo. And if you look at um, basically all the you know, um, 
phase four trials, there's no actually any, any evidence of increased risk of pancreatitis. Um, but they do increase pancreatic enzymes mildly through a mechanism which is, uh, isn't known. And what it comes down to is if you had a patient which had um, you know, multiple episodes or had previous severe pancreatitis, you might um, decide not to use didoglutide in that group. That might push you towards empagliflozin. If you had, saying that, if you had a patient which had previous pancreatitis, it was mild, it was a clear cause with either gallstones or alcohol, I wouldn't necessarily say that was a complete contraindication to didoglutide. I'd still be considering it in, you know, in that patient if, if appropriate. Medullary thyroid carcinoma is a very rare form of thyroid cancer. Most of you have never seen it. Um, you may well have patients with pillory or follicular thyroid um, cancer, which is by far the most common forms. Um, but if you had a patient with medullary thyroid carcinoma or MEN2 syndrome, which is multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome 2, which is even rarer, you wouldn't use didoglutide in those patients because it's been shown in rodents basically to increase the risk of medullary thyroid carcinoma. That hasn't been borne out in humans, um, but if you did have a rare patient that took that box, you wouldn't be using didoglutide um, for them. And we'll talk about the, the risk of hypoglycemia in patients on insulin and sulfonylureas. So when you're discussing um, you know, the adverse effects, it's also really useful to talk about tips how to reduce them. Um, and I sort of view it um, in a, you know, as a patient which you um, perhaps you do with someone with severe reflux. Um, you know, you tell patients to eat smaller meals. Um, often it's easier to graze than having bigger meals. And you tell them to eat more slowly. So it's often in these patients, often developing a new relationship with food um, because they may well have not have much appetite suppression beforehand, but all of a sudden that it might be an, a new marked factor. And you tell them to eat to eat to hunger. You know, they don't have to eat if, if they're not hungry. If they feel full, it's a good time to stop because that will reduce the risk of adverse effects. Um, avoid fatty foods and alcohol if they can. Um, we know that they slow gastric emptying independently um, themselves. That's, that's the reason why, why you also avoid those. It's important that patients remain well hydrated. I didn't mention it earlier. I was on, on the slide, but there have been very rare cases of patients that have developed acute renal injury um, because they basically become dehydrated um, due to nausea and or vomiting. You know, the high-risk patients, you know, the ones on diuretics, non steroidals but it can happen in anyone. So you're just saying, you know, you're recommending if, if it nausea does occur, please just make sure that you, that you, you know, you drink plenty of water and stay well hydrated. Now, for the vast majority of patients that you've got, um, hypoglycemia won't be an issue, okay? So if you've got patients which are not on insulin or sulfonylureas, you don't need to worry about hypos at all. If you've got patients which are on insulin and sulfonylureas and the HbA1c you know, is over 75, your risk of hypoglycemia, once again, is extremely low. Monitoring of blood glucose levels will give you the, the best guide to that. Um, but if I had a patient with that, I wouldn't be doing changing the rest of the regimen at all. You're adding it on. You know, it's escalation of therapy. But if you've got a patient where you're worried about hypos, and that's really, you know, you might have um, typically those patients in HbA1c less than 64 millimole per mole, or they may be very high risk, you know, frail elderly HbA1c maybe less than 75. Um, a good ballpark figure to reduce the risk of hypos is halving the dose of sulfonylureas. And that will be at all meals that you've got them on. And also roughly about a 15 to 20% reduction in their daily insulin. And that's both basal and prandial insulin. And the other patients you just want to keep in, in regular contact with, just to make sure that their, their glucose levels aren't going too low or too high. These are just starting points. You may need to go either way. And patients which have you know, a very marked um, reduction in oral intake, you might find that you need a greater reduction. Because you, um, in other patients, you might find that you actually need to um, rapidly escalate therapy back up just because they've got persistent hypoglycemia. You will typically see um, the glucose lowering effects of deglutide within the first um, two to three weeks. So that will give you an idea of, of what you need to do. For the vast majority of patients, I think it'd be reasonable to organize a follow -up appointment in, in three months um, with a repeat HbA1c. Just for those, if you, you're worried about you know, the high risk, worry about their glucose levels, I, th I think it'd be great even if you had um, a nurse appointment or just a phone call um, in a week to make sure everything's okay, or that you know, the provisor they can contact the practice if they have any adverse effects. In terms of precautions, 
To date, there's no safety data in either pregnancy, breastfeeding, uh, or children um, less than 18 years of age. So I wouldn't be um, using it in, in those groups um, whatsoever. Um, sometimes in specialist care, we might introduce um, dirglutide um, a little bit earlier, you know, 16, 17, if they're fully grown, but I'd be contacting secondary care just for um, peace of mind um, if you've got a patient less than 18 years of age. The other thing, um, which I guess the safety hasn't been proven in end-stage renal failure with the EGFR less than 15, um, but all of a sudden, you know, we've got an age of between, um, you know, for an EGFR between 15 to 30 that we can use dilaglutide in. So remember empagliflozin at this stage, um, we can't use with an EGFR less than 30. Um, that will likely change over the upcoming years, but at the moment, you know, as soon as the EGFR drops down, we have to stop the empagliflozin. Um, but we still can use dilaglutide with an EGFR between 15 to 30. Um, so it is um, it can be a very useful agent in that group. And the glucose lowering effects um, are still persistent regardless of the EGFR. Whereas you know with empagliflozin, remember that, that the lower the EGFR, the less of the glucose lowering effect um, that you have. Um, but because of the adverse effects, there are patients which you aren't going to use dilaglutide um, in. The main um, one, I guess, will be um, those with severe gastrointestinal disease. And I'll say particularly those that have delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis already. That's not an uncommon um, end-stage complication of, of diabetes. Perhaps it's, um, it's a bit overdiagnosed um, at times. Or if you've got a patient with severe reflux, I'd be, I'd be very, very cautious about using um, dudaglutide in that group. There'd be nothing wrong with getting the um, reflux under control with a um, PPI and then um, you know, starting dudaglutide at a later date. Um, you know, this is about controlling things first before, before you jump in. The other group I'll be worried, there's no absolute cutoff with, with age. Um, you know, we've got some patients which are, you know, very fit. Well, 78 year olds, we've got some patients which are, you know, very frail at 62. Um, but just thinking, if you've got someone that's frail or elderly, just, I would be cautious, um, particularly those at high risk of potentially an acute renal injury. And we've sort of spoken about pancreatitis and medullary thyroid carcinoma. There's no real data to date um, for dudaglutide other types of diabetes. So once again, I'd only use it in type two diabetes and talk with um, secondary care if you're thinking about and, and other, other types of diabetes. So in terms of when should you be using it? What are the clinical indications? I hope um, most of you over the past year have managed to look at our um, NCSD management algorithm um, for, for type two diabetes. But I'll go through this um, in more detail. So it's just remembering that lifestyle management and metformin are still the cornerstones of management for all patients with type 2 diabetes. But now we're thinking about what do I do to escalate therapy when the HbA1c is above target um, despite that. Now remember our target is less than 53. There seems to be a, a little bit of a hangover that 64 is the target. Less than 53 millimoles per mole is our target. HbA1c in the vast majority of patients. Now, even at diagnosis, we now recommend to consider a second agent. Um, you know, if HbA1c is greater than 64, that's because you're unlikely to get the patient down to target on metformin and lifestyle management alone. So you see, you're being proactive, you're reducing that clinical inertia. If a patient's got cardiovascular disease or renal disease, you're now thinking about adding an SGL2 inhibitor or dudaglutide early. If, if they don't, um, you know, we've still got, um, you know, vildagliptin is still a very good agent to use, use in this space. The most important question when you're thinking about escalating a therapy is, um, it's down the left-hand side here of, of the algorithm, is I've got my patient on lifestyle management on metformin. I then ask myself, do they have renal disease or heart disease or cardi ca any cardiovascular disease? It includes cerebrovascular disease, includes um, peripheral vascular disease. Um, and a five-year CVD risk greater than 15% also falls in this category. So, you know, do they have this, you know, do they already have um, um, cardiovascular? This is secondary prevention, or we're looking at, you know, very high-risk primary prevention. If so, you're going to be using empagliflozin or dudaglutide. That can be a really hard um, decision, and I'll, I'll go through that in terms of, of, of um, you know, what, what's going to push you one way or the other. If they don't, it's when you've got all your other agents um, in terms of you know, escalation of therapy. Now, sulfonylureas and insulin are still 
part of you know our treatment regimen but they used to be you know second and third line agents they now become third and fourth line agents and that's because they cause weight gain and um, the potential of hypoglycemia so the whole um, I guess, you know, there's been a paradigm shift. We used to have a very, you know, very much a stepwise ladder based on glycemic control. We're now moving towards, you know, treating cardiovascular and renal disease because that's what patients end up getting sick and dying from. So here are the, the times, I guess, you know, the best practice when, when to use them. And this is a mismatch slightly from the special authority criteria. Um, so that's important to think that the special authority criteria isn't, you know, the gold standard for how you use use either deuterglutide or empagliflozin. So if you've got, sort of spoken about, if you've got um, renal disease, cardiovascular disease, or high cardiovascular risk, patients will benefit from either deuterglutide or empagliflozin. It's the same, same for both, regardless of the HbA1c. Okay, so even if you've got a patient, um, you know, with an HbA1c of, you know, 50, you think that's great, you're still going to be thinking about these agents and these patients. You might well end up stopping other agents that don't have any extra benefits, but you know, it's still these patients will benefit. The other time is because these agents cause weight loss, you may actually be thinking about them as second line agents after um, you know, after metformin if the HPNC remains above target. Or if you've got someone that you may have started, say metformin or vertigliptin, for example, because they've got normal weight, you know, you go to third line management. You're then thinking about, you know, would they benefit from deuterglutide or empagliflozin? So, um, and I will say it's been, um, it's great that we've now got deuterglutide here, but some patients will benefit more from empagliflozin than they will from deuterglutide, but many patients also benefit more from deuterglutide than empagliflozin. And um, if, um, I will say, probably now is a good time to say, it. if you've got a patient that's on and that does have cardiovascular disease or renal disease, and the, if, say, for example, you've started empagliflozin, if the HbA1c remains above target, deuterglutide is the next best agent. Okay, that's what you'd do if, if you had no restrictions on your clinical practice, that's the agent which you'd use next. Similarly, if you had a patient, you know, with cardiovascular renal disease, which was on um, metformin and deuterglutide, empagliflozin is the next best agent, um, regardless, you know, if, if you no restrictions. That's not what the funding criteria changes, hope, uh, says. Hopefully that changes with, with time. Um, but and that's because they have basically synergistic reductions in both cardiovascular, or definitely in cardiovascular disease, likely in renal disease, but we're waiting that data as, as well. So just think about that in terms of talking to your patients about, uh, about best practice. Um, and here is the um, I guess the difference in terms of the special authority criteria. So hopefully lots of you have this imprinted on, on your brains um, since February. So it's the same special authority criteria for both deuterglutide and empagliflozin. So it's only for type 2 diabetes. It's only for those on HbA1c above 53. And they must have been on um, another glucose glucosidone therapy for at least three months. It doesn't matter if it's metformin, vildagliptin, insulin, softener, it doesn't matter which, which one it is. And then they must have meet one of the following criteria. So the Maori or Pacific ethnicity, if there are any evidence of diabetic renal disease, that's an albinocretin ratio greater than three and or an EGFR less than 60. If they've got cardiovascular disease, if they've, or they've got high cardiovascular risk, it should be so greater or equal to 15 um, on a standardized calculator um, or onset of diabetes at, at a young age. Now there's no strict cutoff of what you may call young, I'm getting older, so I think less than 40 is reasonable as, as a cutoff. Um, there is some supporting documentation that says less than 25, it's, but it's to be used within your clinical jurisdiction. So, you know, most people that develop 30s, you can definitely qualify that as, as a young, young age. But you can only choose one in terms of empagliflozin or deuterglutide. So there is no, um, you know, contraindication why you can't use them together. It's what you would do pretty much in every other country in the world. It's a purely financial decision at this stage, okay? So it's about also discussing um, self-funding um, when clinically appropriate. So deuterglutide, just to let you know, has been listed at about $115 excluding GST. Um, Embicoflozin is listed for $58 um, excluding um, GST. Now, anecdotally, in terms of talking to local pharmacies, um, patients are being charged roughly about $85 per month um, for empagliflozin and about $240 per month um, for, for deuterglutide. 
It's still, you know, one of the, um, still probably the cheapest GLP-1 receptor agonist. But if you're going to have a patient on both empagliflozin and dutaglutide, I'll get the dutaglutide funded and they can self-fund the empagliflozin if you choose both. It's by far the, the, cheaper, the cheaper option. Here's what the special authority criteria looks like in terms of what, what you see in your screen when you're applying for it. Um, basically, you can do a tick a box. If they've already been on empagliflozin, there's no problems at all with switching. Um, you can just tick that box and you're pretty much done for the for special authority. Otherwise, you go through and tick, tick the appropriate boxes. If you, one thing to know is if you do complete the special authority for dutaglutide, it will cancel their special authority for empagliflozin. Okay, so they can still carry on the empical flows until the scripts run out. But you can't give a script for um, a script for both. So it's, it's, it's one, or, one or the either. So when should patients self-fund? Um, so if you've got a patient where it's clinically appropriate, so the rest of the special authority criteria is, is great, you know, in terms of um, the, the clinical indications. If they've got renal disease, cardiovascular disease, or high cardiovascular risk, and HBNC may be the target, so you know it's not above the 53. These are patients which should still be discussing um, the role of dilgutide empagliflozin in. Um, or once again, if these patients have an HBNC above target, um, despite either dilgutide empagliflozin. And now we're thinking about you know in our non maori non pacific patients, anyone that's overweight or obese who has an HBNC above target despite lifestyle management metformin. In an ideal world, we'll go for these agents. And those that are normal weight, um, we, um, we may be thinking about you know, them as third line agents, but once again, only in the HbA1c above target. But in those with cardiovascular disease or renal disease, even if the HbA1c is the target, they will likely benefit from the agents. Okay, so it's not just glycemic control um, that we're thinking about. So, Coming down, I think this is probably one of the toughest things. It's it's a hard decision um, for me, and I do this every day. Um, it's but it's choosing, you know, what's best for my patients. Do the glutide empagliflozin. Now it's hard to give you an evidence based answer at all because there's no head to head studies. Um, it's as simple um, as simple as that. So you're going on really best guess, best interpretation of the literature. I will say, do the glutide likely leads to greater reductions in HbA1c and weight. Um, and also has a potential role in primary prevention, which empagliflozin doesn't have. So you can see the, that's, that definitely twists your arm more towards dilaglutide. What dilaglutide and other GLP-1 receptor agonists have also been shown to do is they've been shown to reduce the risk of strokes, whereas empagliflozin and SGL2 inhibitors haven't. Okay, so all of a sudden, you know, if you're trying to prevent strokes, it's going to push you more towards dilaglutide. Um, empagliflozin has been definitively shown to reduce renal disease and heart failure. So either those two are factors, that's going to push you towards um, you know, empagliflozin more so than, than dutaglutide. At the end of the day, um, you know, patient preference is obviously going to be a big, big factor here. And I've got plenty of patients which rather prefer um, to take you know, injection once a week um, than pills every day. I've also got an equal number you know, which would rather have pills with the thought of an injection um, scares them. I always have that conversation. You know, most patients I see have checked their glucose levels at some point, and I've, I've done the injections. I think it hurts about 10 times less than, than pricking your finger. And most patients tend to come around, but you may need to emphasize that, you know, although it's an injection for diabetes, it's not insulin. There's still a very reasonable fear of insulin in, in the community. Um, insulin's a very good drug, um, but, you know, people are scared of hypos and changes in, in jobs, et cetera. Um, but it's really making that point, dutaglutide isn't is an insulin. So I've put a table together. Um, it's not perfect, but it covers a, a, lot, of, a lot of situations. Um, the other thing I'll say is think about the adverse, the potential adverse effects, because that's going to also push you one way or the other. So for example, if you've got a patient that's got gastrointestinal disease, particularly gastroparesis, and you don't want to use dutaglutide, well, hey, empagliflozin is the perfect alternative. If you've got also on the other sort of other hand, if you've got a patient you know that has recurrent thrush or balantitis, um, or they may be on um, you know a keto diet, which I'll talk about more in a second, that's going to push you more towards um, dutaglutide um, than, than empagliflozin, and it's fine to switch them over. You know, it's, and be, as I say, don't don't let that stress you. And I've had lots of questions about that over the, over the past few weeks. With um, keto diets and empagliflozin, um, 
we recently put out a position statement on behalf of NZSSD as others around, around the world have had. We know that there's this risk of um, DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis on empagliflozin. It's about one in a thousand. We probably have had slightly more cases than that across the country. And I'll say that the vast majority of cases have been either due to patients not stopping it um, when they're unwell. So not, I guess, observing those sick day management um, guidance or they've been on keto diets. And so, and often they haven't told, you know, the, you know, the health professionals that they're switching diets. So it's also important, you know, we're talking to the patients, are they, um, you know, are they actually on a low carbohydrate diet? And it's less than roughly about 130 grams a day of carbohydrate. Most of the others have that one meal. Um, but just thinking about that, um, we have recommended, you know, actually discussing the dietitian if, you, if you're just unsure about the carbohydrate intake. It's also warning them saying, look, hey, if you're going to make a major change in your diet, please let us know. Um, but the other patients where you think, hey, is this going to be easier to put them on, on dutaglutide? If you've got an EGFR between 15 to, to 30, that's an easy decision. They can only have dutaglutide. They can't have empical flows in. Um, and, you know, if a cerebral vascular disease, prime prevention, you know, very obese, you think about dutaglutide, heart failure, renal disease, empical flows in. And most of our patients have you know, a lot of those all together. You think about overall, what's the biggest factor? What's the biggest thing I'm trying to do here? And that's probably what's going to um, twist your arm one way. And hopefully we can have both agents for these groups in the not so distant future. So I thought I'd go through an, another case. Um, and these are all um, sort of based on, on real life um, experience. I've used a bit of artistic license just to get points across. Um, we've got Mrs. T, who's a 58-year-old Samoan woman. Um, once again, that typical history of type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, um, renal disease, and, and a very, I guess, high five-year cardiovascular risk. So your HPNC is not unreasonable. Um, it's 63 millimole per mole on, on galvimet um, and glycoside. Um, and she's got no evidence of heart failure, but she does have those recurrent episodes of, of vaginal thrush. So, you know, you're thinking, hey, look, you know, she's got predominantly renal disease. Um, I'd, I'd love to use empical flows in here. On the other hand, you've got, um, you know, very high cardiovascular risk. You've got primary prevention. You've got central obesity. Maybe do the glutide be, be better. But you don't want to cause more thrush. So you end up going for, um, for, for do the glutide. So remember when you start do the glutide that you, um, that you stop the vertigoptin. So, you, you know, you're switching it to metformin alone. I've just noticed on this case that um, the EGFR is actually slightly low to be on one gram twice a day. Remember, that's the EGFR drops down to less than 60. I mean, you need to re reduce the dose of the metformin. But because you're worried about a risk of hypoglycemia, so your baseline HB on C was 63 millimole per mole before you started um, glutide, you're halving her, her glucoside. So... Um, and you told her, you basically warned of the adverse effects and you asked her to, to contact the practice if these occurred. Then three days later, um, she rings up to tell you that she's had significant nausea. Um, she hasn't been able to eat much at all. Um, and as a result, um, she ended up having an episode of hypoglycemia. So it's thinking, what would you do um, in this situation? So that the, the no um, brain hit, you stop her glucoside um, and you're reminding her to... Um, also remain well hydrated. She may not be eating much, but you know, at least if you can keep the fluids up, you know you're going to prevent um, any, any sequelae. But you still get that point home that, hey, this nausea is going to get better. Um, and you go through your advice again, you eat to hunger, smaller meals more frequently, not two hours before bed, etc. And then you can um, obviously want to keep in touch if the nausea gets worse. Now you can use antiemetics um, for um, if the nausea is too bad, but very, very rarely are, are they required. But just to let you know, you know, there is a potential option um, if you need to. Um, so nurse phones her back um, a week after her first injection. She still has, you know, mild nausea, but at least the hypoglycemia has gone away. And I think it would be reasonable if you've got um, most patients, <coughs> excuse me, most patients you can continue on the weekly injection. But if you've got a patient that's got significant gastrointestinal symptoms, I'd actually be delaying that injection, um, you know, by a few days. Um, and then, you know, you go for it again and that will just re reduce the, the gastrointestinal adverse effects. Um, so 
but most patients, you know, you, you'd be able to go weekly straight straight from the get-go, just thinking about, you don't want to make a patient more miserable if they're, if they're miserable already. But even in these patients, and this happened um, in uh, a few patients like this, um, even if they do have you know, nausea and you might delay the first injection, within you know, a month or so, they're tolerating the dirty glutide well and they, and they get the HPNC um, band down to target. And remember, once you get a patient to target, um, you measure the HPNC every six months. That's new guidance, okay? Um, as you know that, I guess, type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. If the HPNC isn't to target, in an ideal world, you'd be getting patients to repeat the HPNC every three months um, and escalating therapy as required. It's about trying to reduce that clinical inertia that I spoke about. We don't want to leave our patients for years um, with HPNCs at um, similar levels. We may have held off insulin previously, but hey, now we've got new agents which we can use um, which aren't insulin. So 12 months later, um, you get a back, and your HPNC has increased um, to 56. Um, one thing you find that, you know, you may have been nervous about empagliflozin in, in the first situation with a vaginal thrush, but you get patients glycemic control better and often losing weight and the, um, you know, the thrush resolves. So she's now developed peripheral vascular disease or a history suggestive of that. And what's the next best step um, in escalation of therapy? Um, and just think about, you know, she's got HPNC above target. She's got cardiovascular disease. Um, she's already on metformin glutide. In this situation, embicoflozin would actually be the next best treatment, but it's not funded. Okay, if it was, if she was prepared to self-fund, um, you know, that'd be great, um, $85 a month, um, realistically, to inform your patients. I've always been surprised by um, how many patients are able to, to fund when you, when you go through the, um, through the options. Um, at the same stage, if she wasn't able to um, afford that, um, which is, it is a lot of money in terms of outside, you know, many people's capabilities. Um, this is when you'll be thinking about, you know, maybe I do have to use sulfonaria in, in this situation. Um, as you remember, you can't use vertigupta, which is on, on dirtaglutide already. It's another case. Um, and this is, a, um, this is a young guy. It's actually a guy I, I saw, um, saw in private. Um, so, I mean, it's bad, but it's great when patients have, you know, when financial capabilities aren't, aren't an issue in terms of optimizing their glycemic control. Um, so he's 32 years old, uh, Māori, um, type 2 diabetes with um, um, central obesity and smoker. So his HPNC was 85 millimole per mole, um, one gram metformin three times a day. I made that deliberate. I still see one gram TDS of metformin quite often. You don't get any real dose benefit above one gram twice a day with metformin. Um, all you're going to get is gastrointestinal effects if you increase the dose further. So I don't use doses greater than greater than two grams a day. Um, he's a typical patient, I guess. He's very keen to avoid monitoring his glucose levels um, or or insulin. So it's thinking, what's the next best escalation of therapy for him? Now, and um, for, yeah, here we have, and this wouldn't matter if there's any patient walked in the door, because you've got a patient with young who's got diabetes, who's overweight, with an HPNC above target, um, despite, you know, metformin and lifestyle management. So for him, it's, um, you know, dutaglutide or, or, um, or embicoflozin. I actually started both um, together, um, as I knew he wasn't going to reach target on one, you know, one agent alone. So um, I started, um, um, basically started both agents at once, combined the embicoflozin with metformin as Jardia met. Um, to just reduce the number of, number of tablets. He stopped smoking. This is a, it is a, often a great buy-in to get patients to um, that are smoking. So, you know, most patients, if they stop, that money alone will pay for, um, pay for agents. So sometimes it can be, it can be a buy-in. Um, and already his HPNC has come down to target, you know, 47 millimole per mole. Um, he's got no risk of hypoglycemia. He's not on insulin and sulfonarias. He, um, he's doing great. Hopefully he loses, loses some weight. Um, so that's just an example of how, you know, um, it's not uncommon to think about starting two or three agents at once, if you know that one agent's not going to get in the target alone. You know, I know that probably the, you know, that the best practice algorithm that came out in 2011, 2012, it said wait three months, you know, that's just creating clinical inertia. It's about going, um, going straight away um, in, in, in terms of, you know, what, what you need to get these patients to target. With the, um, I know that, uh, monitoring glucose levels may come up. Um, 
I think it's always great for patients um, to check their glucose levels whenever they're unwell. Um, and you can also get them to, you know, if they are interested in knowing the effects, if you want to know early, you can talk about strategic blood glucose monitoring. When I talk about strategic, if, if I got a patient where, you know, I just want to know what, what they are, their worst of times, often they're getting to check, you know, two hours after their largest meal of the day, which is typically dinner. Um, and you might find, you know, that will give you a good guide to really what their, um, what their controls like. So you're, you're basing it on the, on the individual. There are a number of useful resources out there. Um, there is our guidance, um, Heaka Huranga, which is the, um, I guess now the educational arm of Pharmac. We've developed some good algorithms with them um, and Health Navigator um, as well has got very good patient information. And we're slowly getting all our information over onto Health Pathways. Um, and I've actually been involved in all of these. Um, so I know that they're, they're consistent um, and they hopefully be out there. Not every DHB has currently joined up to our health pathways. Um, but it's going to be the same pathway essentially across the country, except for referrals. Um, the medication is the first pathway that's undone. So hopefully most of you have seen an updated pathway in, in your region. Um, but the NTSD guidance, um, if, if you go to it, it's got all, basically everything I've spoken about tonight. Um, it's got all, in fact, anything at all on, on different aspects of diabetes management. It's tried to be brief, concise, um, pragmatic advice, um, basically on, um, on everything that you should, should hopefully know, but not, not too laborsome at the same time. Um, here's just an example of um, the you know, typical algorithms that you can, can follow in terms of Heaka um, Huranga, Health Navigator, if you go there, you, know, you can just click on the doodle glutide. There's a print um, friendly version that you can give to patients there. Hopefully you'll also be given the, the booklets um, by Lily in terms of the Trulicity um, booklets, or well, the pharmacy um, may have them as well um, in terms of um, for patients. It's often very helpful. Um, and it also, it's great for patients to have, particularly for empagliflozin, and I guess that's sick day management advice um, as well. So I hope you've got plenty of time for, um, for questions. Um, so I thought the main points is that, you know, you've got the patient in front of you, um, you're warning them of the adverse effects, and you're really reassuring them it's transient, you instruct them how to inject, remember to stop them at filming, but you can continue everything else. You may decide to reduce the insulin softenery as if, if needs be, um, but it's escalation of therapy. We're not switching. There's still a bit of a misnomer that we switch therapy. It's, you're adding on. It's escalation. You're making sure all your patients have follow-up. You may think about phone follow-up on those that are very high risk. And remember, if the H1C is still elevated in three months, you're escalating, um, escalating therapy. So thank you for listening. Um, take home point, if you remember nothing else, is just try and minimize clinical inertia in the, in the everyday, everyday practice. Over to you, Bruce. Okay, thank, thank you, Ryan. That was great. Um, we've, got, we've got quite a few questions here. Uh, first one, it's somebody from Fiji, either Fijian or Fijian classified as specific. Well, I know I, I would easily. <laughs> uh, let's be honest, Fijian Indians are virtually the highest risk um, than anyone yeah. else in terms of diabetes. So I'd be treating them aggressively. Let's just decide now. Eh? Yes, yeah, I, I, I would. <laughs> I, I would do us. I'd, I'd classify them as specific. And a great question here about. Um, from Louise, I was informed by the company that when we are recommending dual therapy, we can prescribe 25 milligrams Jardians and, and split it in half. Uh, and that way it, it does not affect absorption. Would you go along with that as a way of getting cheaper? If you, you say you'd um, yeah. pay for the Jardians and um, cut, the, um, cut it in half. I'm a great fan yeah. of that. I'm, I'm a big fan of it too. I do that for, for everything. The only is that's a good point. So with, with the empagliflozin, so you've got the two doses, you've got the 10 milligram per day dose, and you've got the 25 milligram per day dose. Um, they've basically got the same lowering of cardiovascular disease and renal disease. The only time that you increase up is to reduce, you know, for glu glucose, reducing HbA1c. So that is definitely a way that you could um, cheat the system, so to speak. It's the splitting tablets only an issue of the delayed absorption, isn't it? My understanding. Yeah, I know. It should be it should be fine in terms of um, you know all the major medications. It hasn't shown did a good hasn't been shown to adjust the bioavailability of them, and that includes warfarin if you're worried about about that as well. Yeah. Uh, do you have a preferred antiemetic? No, I haven't. Um, you know, you, you think um, mechanistically wise that domperidone and methylcyclopramide might be the 
the best ones because um, gastric emptying. Um, but I actually looked this up the other day. I couldn't find any evidence on um, saying what's the best best antiemetic. I usually go to domperidone just because it's easy. But I, that, that's not evidence based. Someone may know. That's that's in the audience. Okay, we'll see, we'll see if the audience has got um, uh, got any any answers there. Um, right. Um, what if CHF is active with some pulmonary edema? What would you do in that situation? Yeah, I, I still wouldn't be. I mean, improving glycemic control is still important. Um, I guess none of these agents have ever used, been done. I guess safety trials in terms of someone's got you know quite um, severe active heart failure. It may be, I'll tell you, if some, you've got someone in that state, it will probably push you more towards empagliflozin over, over dutaglutide, um, if you had to choose between the two. Um, just out of safety-wise, I mean, they've probably got bigger fish to fry than diabetes, if, you know, if, if they're quite overloaded, and you might just choose to get them, you know, get them a little bit drier before you start. But it's not, it's not an absolute contraindication, put it that way. It's treat, treat the patient in front of you. And the other thing was, I put a gem about it the other day. Uh, Infigaflozin is effective for a CHF with preserved yep. ejection fraction. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's, it's I'll tell you, the cardiologists want it. Um, you know, they want it for patients without without diabetes. Yeah. SGL2, infigaflozin, and other SGL2 inhibitors be one of the. You know, we, we talk about um, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or in, in Tristo, and spironolactone. SGL2 inhibitors actually fits in that four group. It will be a, be a major treatment for heart failure. I'm curious, the these drugs have been around since 2014, but all the trials seem to be coming through in the last couple of years. Is that because I've taken five years to do, or uh, why the delay? I know a lot of them, if you think about, um, well, well, initially, well, one thing that um, what the FDA said, if you can remember when, when rosiglitazone came out in the early 2000s um, and showed increased risk of, um, okay. I guess, in, increased risk of um, MI, and death, that all of a sudden we had to start producing these large safety trials, um, basically to show that diabetic agents didn't increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. So uh, right. then they came out and then, hey, it wasn't expected, but so actually we've got major reductions here in, in cardiovascular disease and renal disease. Now we're gonna start designing trials to actually show that these effects are real. And so it's it's been a little bit, it's been, a little bit back to front it has been almost led by safety studies and then proof of concept after that. Uh, if using both empagliflozin and dilaglutide, is the weight loss greater? Yeah, it is. Um, it is greater. They work by different different mechanisms. Um, and But once again, I will push, you know, every time that push lifestyle management as much as you can. And, you know, often giving a little bit of, a, you know, a pharmacotherapeutic push um, can be enough to you know get patients to start seeing results. Is it is dilaglutide safe to use preconception? Yeah, that's a, sorry, I didn't talk about that. It's a very good question. Um, you will have many patients with type two diabetes and polycystic ovarian syndrome, and dilaglutide actually increases the um, the chances of ovulation, and that's up and above um, metformin um, and and glycemic control. So for some women, you may actually induce ovulation. So contraception becomes Comes, becomes important. If, um, in terms of conception, if you had someone that was very high risk, I, I would consider switching them. Um, but if you had a patient that became pregnant, what I'll do, I'll, I'll just stop the dutaglutide as, as, soon as, as soon as you found out. Um, if you delay the dose by three days due to nausea, do you move the next dose by seven days? Or do yeah, you I, I, I do. Week? It's, well, I, I, well it, to be honest, it doesn't. As long as you get them into routine eventually, but I would delay it again a week between injections just because that. But um, you know, it wouldn't hurt if they then you know ten days and went, then went to their weekly injection. It's just about getting them getting them started. Because once you get them started, they'll they'll be away laughing. It's just that, that initial period. Uh, you mentioned keto diets. Any comments on intermittent fasting or extreme weight loss plans? Yeah, with um, do the glutide's fine. So it takes away all those all those worries in terms of fasting. Um, so you've got no concerns there. With empagliflozin, um, look, it's been shown a lot comes down to to daily carbohydrate in terms of the type of fasting. Um, so for example, during Ramadan, there's no increased risk of um, DKA. Um, but if you had a patient which was 
as part of the extreme weight loss was low carbohydrate, I'll be it should be switching those patients from empagliflozin to, to dulaglutide. Um, if you stop dulaglutide to start dulaglutide, is there a washout period? Ah, uh, you don't need to worry about about anything. So saying there's no washout period. Um, so I've also been asked this quite a bit. So I'll say it quick, there's no washout period between um, empagliflozin or dulaglutide as well. So, I mean, I've got patients which have finished their last month with the empagliflozin despite, you know, I've started dulaglutide. That, that's absolutely fine as well. Is dulaglutide okay to use if the patient is obese with raised triglycerides greater than 17? No history of pancreatitis, large dose of lentis, 50 BD. Yeah, I would. Um, I mean, if they had no history, of I'll, I'll go for it. Um, glycemic control and, you know, reduced um, carbon fat intake would be, be what you need. I'd, I'd, I'd go for it. What's the approach to lowering triglycerides um, these days? Yeah, it's still, I mean, I'll be honest, the vast majority of patients, um, you, if you get appropriate dietary, um, follow dietary intervention and reduce the alcohol intake, you'll get them down to single figures. Yep. Um, and then um, there's still no, I'll be honest, there's still no survival benefit in terms of fibrates or niacinate in, in patients with diabetes. Um, but if you had patients with, you know, pancreatitis, um, you would be, and you're basically aiming to treat down to single figures if you can. The lower the better. Almost, you, you can get almost everyone to target. And glycemic control is a big factor, part of that. And often insulin is required. Um, but pioglitazone, you know, metformin, pioglitazone, and to some extent, um, GLP-1 receptor can have a role. Right. Uh, Dermot's question, how cautious do we need to be in the elderly? Do you have an 80-year-old? on 16 units of Lantus daily, good renal function, HBC, 70s, um, worth stopping insulin and starting dulaglutide? Yeah, I'd be, in someone like that, I'd be tempted if it's not broke, um, then why fix it? Um, there is, I will say the, the majority of the trials haven't been done in the elderly. So in terms of the experience with them, isn't great. I mean, if they were a very good 80 year old, you could potentially consider it. Um, but at the same time, I'd be um, tempted, you know, just not, not to change things for that guy. Do you start an anti-nausea prophylactically when starting to oh. No. So you oh, I, 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 don't, I don't routinely. And most patients, to be honest, most, I've had quite a bit of experience with dulaglutide now. I've had hardly anyone that's had severe nausea. Uh, what's the duration of the HbA1c effect coming down with, and I guess you're competing against age, aren't you, and time? Oh, you are in, in terms of the, I, I guess, um, well, start with HB1C. And, uh, um, so 50% of your HB1C is over the past month, about 25% over, you know, the month before that, and the other 25% over the three months. So I guess in terms of seeing the full effect on HB1C, that's why it takes, takes the full three months. Um, the, um, the effects can, you still get the reductions in any age. Um, but you're right, the older you are, typically the less insulin reserve you've got, so typically the, the less response you, you get. So that, that is definitely part of it as well. So, I mean, our young ones, often our young ones, you know, with diabetes really struggle. These are, I mean, these are great patients for dilaglutide. Good. Um, I often find elevated lipase in the absence of pancreatitis. Is it obesity related? I put them on Trulicity if ultrasound is normal. The reasonable straight. Yeah, I would. Um, yeah, I just I wouldn't be measuring it. Um, <laughs> in the first, I, I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the, you know, it's elevated quite often. Um, and we know that in trials and the measured lipase, it will go up. But look, if someone, even if they had an elevated lipase and they had no history of pancreatitis or no symptoms suggestive of it, I'd still be, I'd still be trying it. Right. I, I wouldn't be put off by it. Right, you know, sometimes you don't want to know the answers to some tests, do you? Exactly, it's just like measuring um, creatine, you know, CK on statins. You just don't want to, you don't want to know. Um, where does Phil the Glipton stand before thinking of Jardians or Trulicity in the first case? Yep, well, the Glipton's still a very good agent. Oh, I want to get that, particularly for those that are normal weight um, or the elderly, um, even those with renal disease, it's, it's, it's very well, um, very well tolerated. Um, with um, so it's really so I would even go to if someone didn't have cardiovascular renal disease and their normal weight I'll be using vital in a second line then I wouldn't actually be using embicliflozin or dulaglutide in those patients 
Um, it's really only those patients which are, you know, overweight, obese, or got cardiovascular or renal disease, they'll be the ones where I'll be um, pushing more towards um, more, more towards um, empiclofosinol or dilglutide. Okay. Um, so one from Sarah here. Those with high CV disc and microalbuminuria, but HBC is within target. Could we prescribe either dulaglutide or empiclofosinol in a patient happy to self fund? Yeah, I think I think that that's that's reasonable. Um, you could you could go for either one. In those patients, to be honest, I'm not um, I'm not really fussed either way, pushed either way. I go by more by the other factors. Many patients will have mild microalbuminuria from obesity alone, and actually getting their weight down will will, will normalise it. Um, but that, that that would be that would be reasonable, you know, if particularly if they're overweight and the HBNC is above target. Okay, now here's a, here's a tricky one. How do you manage patients who have HbA1c less than 53, don't, so don't qualify for funding, but on galvimic glycoside insulin and would benefit either from either new medicine? Do you stop medicines and wait yeah. for the HbA1c to go up? It sounds like the old repeating statins question yeah. three years ago. Oh, it's, it's a really tricky one, and it's a real ethical dilemma. Um, I think what we do in practice and what we... It might, you know, might be different things. Um, I mean, these are patients which would really benefit. It's just, it's, you know. When Peter Moody was medical director of Pharmac, he said, sometimes you need to bend the rules in the interest of the patient. So I quote him on these occasions. Well, I, I tell you what I do, in, in all honesty, I, I do the special authority. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. um, but I think it's, it's within, you, you know, it's within your clinical judgment. And they, these are the patients which actually start in the new agents you'll be able to get them off the glucoside and, you know, potentially insulin as well. Yeah, well, if you go to jail, we'll try and get you out, so. Thanks, thanks Bruce. Um, okay, uh, Southeast Asian female, HBA1C 101 on metformin, uh, though compliance may be an issue with EGFR 62, normal ACR, can we start her Jardians, though she doesn't fit his special authority? Um, yeah, so she should, um... I just think her, so she had microalbuminuria, did she? Is that? Uh, An ACR was normal, yeah. Oh, ACR was normal. Yeah, the, um, I mean, these are the ones where I guess, um, you know, it'd be nice if they did meet the special authority criteria um, before you did it. Um, she, to be honest, she's probably going to need insulin to get her, get her HPNC to target um, as well. But unless her, she had, I mean, unless she'd onset of diabetes at a young age, I can't just recall the age there. Um, Bruce, but she she may get under under that criteria, unless you plead a poor understanding of geography, perhaps. Well, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, risk of amputations with empagliflozin. Yeah, the um, none none essentially. Initially, there were for um, canagliflozin, another SGL two inhibitor, but it's also found not not to be based. So no no concerns over either in peripheral vascular disease. Be beneficial. Okay. Um, would you consider and just step off? Patients from dulaglutide if target HbA1c remains under control and weight within normal parameters. Yeah, if they didn't have cardiovascular renal disease, I think they'd be they'd be very reasonable. Yeah. Um, if we get, can get patients down to um, you know remission, um, you can then look at withdrawing treatment. Say you got the HbA1c down to target though, I'd always, I'd be keeping on the I'd be removing the sulfonylurea and insulin first. Um, before I take away dulaglutide, but definitely if if you don't need it to treat, I'd, you know, there's no, no point treating. Um, does dulaglutide need to be withheld before surgery? If so, when can it be restarted? Yeah, there's, there's not the concerns like there is with um around around surgery, um, just because there's no risk of DKA. For most surgery, it's absolutely fine to continue. It's also fine for colonoscopy, as it mentioned, to alter bowel prep. And this is something we're actually putting together for the country at the moment as period procedural guidelines um, for these new agents. But if you had a patient that was having GI surgery or very high risk of ILS, I would be withholding the injection before surgery and not restarting it to the complete eating and drinking normally after, after surgery. But for the vast majority of surgery, you're fine. Um, in response to earlier question, Ministry of Health classifies Fiji Indian as non-Pacific. So um, we may just have to... Um... Think about that question. Yeah. Um, any chance of long-term pancreatic exhaustion and dulaglutide use? 
Well, if anything, it's the opposite. Um, so there is this, um, you know, theoretical, um, it's been shown in, I guess, animal studies to preserve beta cell mass. Still waiting to see that in humans. Um, but it's actually the opposite rather than um, exhaustion. Nice question. EGFR is less than 30, <coughs> but estimated creatinine clearance, Cockroft gold formula is more than 30. Which one would you utilize in terms of deciding with holding oral hypoglycemic agents? Yeah, I'd terms? probably go Cockroft gold. I mean, EGFR is a very gross estimation. Yeah. Um, yeah it's actually a good, a good point in terms of, you know, if it's um, borderline calculating it. And all honesty, honestly, um, it won't be long before we lower the EGFR limit for embicoflozin to either 25 or 20. Um, but that, at the moment, we we'll say we should, we should go along with med safe recommendations. Okay. Uh, doc here checking C peptide in people pre starting empagliflozin. Would this give a guide to as to likelihood of response to dualaglutide? I guess it may give you some guide. I don't, I don't do it routinely um, because you also get the benefit from, um, from weight loss, you know, the reduced appetite, weight loss, and, and change in glucagon production. One thing which potentially it may be useful is, is knowing your insulin reserves and risk of DK if you went down the empagliflozin line. Um, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be basing as a major part of your decision making. Uh, other than the effect of lower stress on pancreas due to lower glucose levels, is there any evidence that these two agents, due to their action versus other agents? Will reduce the time to secondary pancreatic failure? Yeah, it's a good question. The, the data is not out yet, is the short answer. They may well do. Um, the only agents, or well, only, we know metformin does, and we know vitagliptin does when in combination with metformin, but we don't know about anything else. We're still awaiting that data, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if these agents do. This might be a good summary question. What's the role of vitagliptin in light of empagliflozin and dualaglutide being available now? Well, I think it's still, um, I guess we touched, it's still a very good second line agent um, for those without cardiovascular renal disease, um, and particularly if the normal weight as well. Yep. So and it's, it's a, I think it's a great agent in the elderly. It's generally very well tolerated. Um, I think I might just keep going for another 10 minutes on questions. We've got about um, uh, eight, eight unanswered at the moment. Okay. And I just think given this is sort of a top up, talk that might be a good idea um is it safe to use dulaglutide in a patient with a family history of thyroid cancer is it safe for a patient with breast cancer question two i do i have to increase decrease insulin first before starting dulaglutide dose that depending on the initial hba1c level yep so to answer those breast cancer absolutely fine thyroid cancer i would ask what type of thyroid cancer it was the vast majority will be papillary follicular if so, you can go ahead and use it. And yes, for the, the baseline HB1C, in terms of giving you a guide to how much you reduce the, um, re whether you reduce the insulin at all. If HB1C is above 70, say, I wouldn't be reducing the insulin at all. Um, if it's below that, you'd be thinking about reducing by that 15 to 20%. Right. Now, don't quite get this question, but could GLP1 be used in ketosis prone type 2 diabetes mellitus? Well, I guess it's where you definitely use it over, over empagliflozin. Um, yep. There's no, um, well, because we've got no safety data and really in type 1 diabetes, which is the potentially the, the closest relative to that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we, if we do with time. Um, but there's, there's no worries at all about making the ketosis worse or DKA. So it'd be fine to use if you did have a ketosis prone yep. patient. Okay, just let the audience know we're going to go through to nine o'clock unless we answer them first. So uh, if you've got the stamina, we'll keep going. Nice question here from Brett. It used to be said if diabetic patients were on a statin, there was no extra benefit from adding aspirin for primary prevention. Please comment. Yep, that's, that's good. good puts. That's changed now over the last so 12 to 18 months. So aspirin, well, I, don't, I don't use aspirin really at all in primary prevention for patients with diabetes. Um, it doesn't work as well, and you've got an increased risk of bleeding compared to patients without diabetes. I'd only be, um, nothing's changed with secondary prevention. Every patient should be on aspirin unless contraindicated. Yep. So you can sometimes use it in primary prevention for those that are extremely high risk. 
um, whether, you know, it's really going to outweigh the risk of bleeding. But for, you know, 95% of your patients, you shouldn't be using aspirin for primary prevention. You may actually need to be stopping it in those patients because of, you know. Yeah, you know, well, I'm now stopping it when they hit 70, actually. I'll put it all yeah. in the paper in the, uh, in the, um, on the prescription, please stop. So even if they're 60, they know to stop it when they're 70. Um, yeah. Oh, we used to go, it wasn't that long ago, we used to put everyone with, you know, on diabetes, on aspirin, statin, ACE inhibitor. Yeah. You know, we now know aspirin's not really effective in primary prevention. ACE inhibitors don't prevent diabetic renal disease. So if you've got someone that's hypertension with no evidence of renal disease, you can use, you can still use an ACE inhibitor ARB. The calcium channel block with thiazide is just as good. And then we're still basing statin on cardiovascular risk. So, you know, practice has changed a lot in the last, yeah. in the last 10 years. Scarily changes a lot. Yeah. And often goes back to what it was originally. <laughs> That's happened in my career on yeah. about 50 different things. Um, what do we need to keep in mind in a patient on Lantus and Nova Rapid for type 2 diabetes, age 35, HbA1c 65? Well, I think one, you, you want to always try to get them to target. Um, these are the patients. I will say, you know, often we go one way on the algorithm. These, for example, these patients will still benefit from the addition of these agents if, if you can. So, and if they qualify, this patient's young, I'll be getting this patient on, on dirtoglutide and trying to get them on the lowest dose of insulin possible. Um, so just because someone's on insulin doesn't mean to say all of a sudden you, you don't add in, add in therapy. These are still patients which really benefit from dirtoglutide. Okay, uh, would you start Jardians if they have an active foot problem? Uh, unless they were septic. Um, or had, you know, significant infection, I would. Okay, dulagutide contraindicated in those with a history of pancreatitis. I think you comment on yeah, that. Yeah, I, th I think that it's definitely not a hard and fast contraindication. Yeah, if you don't know the cause of the pancreatitis, then perhaps. Yeah, I think if you don't know the cause, if they had frequent episodes, yeah. I'd, I'd probably steer in clear in those patients. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I, st I wouldn't, you know, a good cause with, you know, many years ago, I wouldn't make that put you off if they're really going to benefit from it. What about using vildagliptin in patients with fatty liver as advanced as as advised to monitor LFTs and fatty liver patients often have abnormal LFTs? Yeah, they do. I'll be honest, and these patients, to be honest, um, I guess I'm lucky that I have probably great access to ultrasounds. I mean, I often ultrasound, if they've got fatty liver, I tend to ignore their LFTs to, to, to many extent if I've got a known cause for it. Right. Um, and improving their glycemic control will improve their liver function tests. And uh, do either of these drugs help with fatty liver? I thought there was some study on yeah, They do. Um, well, I don't know specifically for well, basically all, the, all these agents have been shown to be beneficial for, for fatty liver. Um, GLP-1 agonists, and it's been more for other agents in the class, have been shown to have you know, much greater benefits up and above um, glycemic control than necessarily... Um, you know, uh, other classes of agents. So, you know, metformin, pioglitazone, and GLP-1 receptor agonists in terms of fatty liver disease are, um, are very useful agents. Is that uh, due to weight loss? Um, potentially, it's also probably due to um, other mechanisms which perhaps we don't, don't fully understand. But glycemic control and weight loss um, are always good for fatty liver disease. Um. Information is increasing erectile dysfunction with dulaglutide. Do you significant enough to not recommend it for a patient who has erectile dysfunction as a primary concern? I think you'd, you'd still give it a go. Um, and if you do know, you could always cross that bridge. Often, I'll say the erectile dysfunction is more often due to hyperglycemia. And by improving that, you can actually improve erectile function. So Rebecca says, oh, it's not sure I understood correctly. The Ryan said ACE inhibitors are no longer regarded as the drug of choice in diabetics with hypertension and microalbuminuria. Oh, no, no, sorry, so I'll make the point clear. If you've got a patient with diabetic renal disease, they should all be on ACE inhibitor and ARB, okay? Yeah. Everyone, and, and potentially, and also an SGL2 inhibitor, um, more so than, than dutaglutide, okay? They should all be. But for patients which have hypertension and no evidence of renal disease, so normal urinary alcohol creatinine ratio, normal EGFR, that's when you can use, you know, a calcium channel blocker or thiazide is just as good as an ACE inhibitor. Uh, but yeah, please, if, if, you, if you've got a patient with renal disease and diabetes, make sure they're all on ACE inhibitor uh, and SGL2 inhibitor if it's type 2 diabetes. All right. Well, I think we've got to the, um, uh, the end of the questions there. So uh, we've, we've beaten the clock. So, we have. Um, Good minutes to spare.
Yeah, so well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ryan. That was just stunning. No, thanks, Bruce. Yep. I was just saying, okay. how can do, if, if people have other areas of interest that again touch with you, you know, in terms of other aspects of diabetes management we haven't touched, more than happy to do that in the new year. Yep, yep, getting lots of thank yous coming in on the um, on the great speaker. Many thanks, yep. Okay. Well, fully agree with that. Okay, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. All the best. Okay. Good night.